Normally, I would sit here and tell you how disappointed I am with Mark Youngblood, but not this week. Instead, this week, I am disappointed with Jay Youngblood. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Tyler Vance Rants. I am your host, Tyler Vance himself. It is June 30th, 1984. Last week, Paul Jones employed a new weapon to continue fighting his war with the boogie woogie maniac Jimmy Valiant in the form of Kamala. Chief Wahoo McDaniel ended his longtime friendship with current NWA World Heavyweight Champion, the Nature Boy Ric Flair, and Cindy Lauper issued a challenge to Captain Lou Albano, a challenge that was accepted. I'll discuss that challenge soon, as we are going to be tuning into the World Wrestling Federation's Championship Wrestling Show first this week. Mean Gene Okerlund and Vince McMahon are calling commentary, and the very first match of the night is a singles match between Rene Goulet and Rocky Johnson. The former WWF World Tag Team Champion is firing on all cylinders as the match gets underway, and a vicious Irish whip almost sends Goulet over the top rope. Not long after this, Rocky Johnson does secure the victory with a 1-2-3 following a sunset flip. Steve Lombardi takes on Jesse the Body Ventura in singles competition next. Gene Okerlund and Vince McMahon spend more time discussing how the body looks rather than the punishment he's dishing out to Lombardi. And there's a look at his physique. Oh, 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 look at that. Ventura toys with Lombardi often allowing him to get a move out or try a test of strength against Jesse Ventura, but it always ends the same for Steve Lombardi. Failure. A falling elbow from the body sends Steve to the cleaners, and that is all she wrote. One, two, three for Jesse Ventura. While we just finished with the body, we now get to witness the hammer, as Greg Valentine takes on the ever unlucky Billy Travis. Accompanying Valentine to the ring is Captain Lou Albano, who has announced that the challenge Cindy Lauper outlined has been accepted, and the woman that the captain has chosen to represent him is none other than current WWF Women's Champion, the Fabulous Moolah. Cindy Lauper, on the other hand, has chosen Wendy Richter to be her representative, and it is only a matter of time before those two women go head to head. Despite Travis's continued streak of bad luck, he actually does manage to make some progress here by putting Greg Valentine into a shoulder lock. Hey, progress is progress. Billy continues to actually impress me as he managed to employ a hip toss against the hammer, which forces Greg Valentine into the corner to take a breather. More offense shortly follows, and holy crap, this kid is on fire! Oh, oh it catches him with a forearm! The hammer actually heads outside of the ring to take a breather, and also reassess the situation with his manager, Captain Albano. You know, this Cindy Lauper drama has gotten to the point where Captain Albano's ability to manage his clients, Greg Valentine in this instance, is getting hampered. That explains how Billy Travis, of all people, is managing to get one up on Greg Valentine. Once back in the ring, Greg Valentine smashes Billy Travis's hopes and dreams. There we go, that's more like it. To Travis's credit, he never gives up and scores several drop kicks on the hammer as well. He's then dumped over the top rope before Greg Valentine finishes the match off by suplexing Travis back into the ring and finishing him off with a figure four leg lock. That was a fantastic effort on Billy's part. Let's see if Jose Luis Rivera and his opponent next can match the energy and intensity of the last match. By the way, who is facing off against Rivera? Mr. Fuji heads down to the ring, but he is not going to be Rivera's opponent. Remember, recently he announced that he is taking a step back from in-ring competition and focusing more on a managerial role. The opponent is George the Animal Steel. Rivera, you better run for the hills. For those unaware of who George Steele is, he never fails to live up to the moniker that he's gained for himself in The Animal, because that's exactly what he acts like once the bell rings. Immediately, George Steele grabs a handful of Jose's hair, 
tossing him outside of the ring. And since this worked up so much of an appetite, George Steele helps himself to a snack in the corner, taking a bite out of the turnbuckle. Yummy. Jose climbs back into the ring, but immediately gets jabbed into the throat by a foreign object from the animal, who expertly hides that object from the referee's view. He may be an animal, but he still has some semblance of intelligence. After another spike, George Steele helps himself to another turnbuckle treat. And then Irish whips Jose Luis Rivera shoulder first into the exposed steel. Moments later, Rivera is then hoisted up by that very same shoulder and forced to submit by the animal. Joe McHugh brings out the WWF World Heavyweight Champion, Hulk Hogan, despite the fact that Jose Luis Rivera is still in the middle of the ring crying out in pain. Well, whatever, the champ is here. Hulk Hogan! My goodness, look at this place go bonkers! A standing over! The Hulkster, to his credit, does actually check on Jose Luis Rivera, but it's a trap. Mr. Fuji and George the Animal Steel wait in ambush and attack Hulk Hogan from behind. Hell, even the referee gets some. This causes Hulk Hogan to get incredibly ticked off, and he eventually ends up chasing the duo out of the ring and backstage, as WWF Championship Wrestling comes to an end. Hey, don't worry, there's plenty more action to come, this time in the National Wrestling Alliance's Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling area. Bob Cottle greets us on commentary as soon as the show begins, and we're immediately brought action between Angelo Mosca Jr. and Doug Vines. Mosca Jr.'s quality of wrestling seems to have seriously degraded since first winning the NWA Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Championship in Episode 5 of my series. Linked down below for your viewing pleasure. Angelo can still create wins, it's just that his energy always seems to be zapped. Angelo blocks a suplex from Doug and employs one of his own before he heads up to the top rope and hits a flying crossbody to secure the first pinfall of Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling. Backstage, Bob Cuddle has the NWA Television Champion Tully Blanchard standing by, who still has that NWA Television Championship still in his possession, and his $10,000. Something I don't think anyone can take from him. Tully Blanchard has tried and tried to break bread with NWA World Heavyweight Champion Ric Flair. And if you remember, recently the pair had a scuffle, resulting in Ric Flair's wardrobe being completely ripped from his body. Despite complimenting the Nature Boy's wrestling ability, it's Flair's personal integrity that Blanchard seems to have taken an issue with. And as well to rub salt in the wounds, Blanchard reads the label off of the jacket that Flair wore during that altercation. Custom tailored for Ric Flair. Right. Dillard's department store? No, I don't know that. <laughs> the television champion then targets Ricky Steamboat, challenging him for the NWA United States Heavyweight Championship. And we don't have to wait long for a response, as Ricky Steamboat then says, the reason he came out of retirement is to become the NWA World Heavyweight Champion. Yeah, we know. You tell us every single chance you get. Instead of answering Tully Blanchard's challenge, Ricky Steamboat instead opts to focus on Chief Walker McDaniel, who, if you may recall from last week, was complaining that he does not get enough title shot opportunities in the National Wrestling Alliance. Steamboat says that being the current NWA United States Heavyweight Champion makes him the number one contender for the Nature Boy Ric Flair's NWA World Heavyweight Championship. So if Chief McDaniel wants that opportunity, first he's going to have to go through Ricky Steamboat. Bob Cottle then immediately gets a word with Chief Walking McDaniel himself, who accepts Ricky Steamboat's challenge. And, I mean, you'd be stupid not to. A free title shot for the NWA United States Heavyweight Championship? Sign me up. Next up, Bob Cottle brings out Rufus R. Freight Train Jones, who says that he always has the Boogie Woogie Maniac Jimmy Valiant on his side, especially when it comes to Paul Jones and his new weapon in the form of Kamala. 
Valiant then comes out and says that neither he nor Jones are ever going to become victims of Paul Jones's hit list. Don't speak so soon. Bob Cottle then catches a few words with Angelo Mosca Jr., who lets us know that his father, despite being strangled half to death a few weeks ago by the masked outlaw and Gary Hart, is doing just fine and has been competing down in Florida recently, which is why we haven't seen him. Baby Kong then goes on to say how much he misses Daddy Kong. But I hope to see him come back up here so we can tag together again. You know, even though he's in Florida, we're in constant touch and he's watching me improve more and more every day. And I'm still in close touch with him. Angelo then continues to stir the pot with regards to the masked outlaw, stating that he is Dory Funk Jr. in disguise. And uh, it's my belief, and it's people's belief, that this man is Dory Funk masquerading under this mask, trying to hide something, I don't know what. Shut up already about it. We get it. You lost the NWA Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Championship to him. It doesn't mean that he's Dory Funk Jr. Enough with your asinine claims. The Youngblood brothers are next to be interviewed by Bob Cottle, but for some reason, Jay Youngblood's back is to the camera while Mark continues to fumble and stumble his way through another interview. But I tell you what, things are coming along well now, and there's a little bit of action going on. There's a little bit of revenge coming along. I told you and I promised the people what I was gonna do, and I'm here to do it now. There was hurt of Jay Youngblood. There definitely was hurt of Jay Youngblood. You're absolutely right, Mark. Bob Cottle, it gives me nothing but great pleasure to come back when the renegade talks, brother. You had better listen. According to Jay Youngblood, the renegade, his new personality or persona, however you want to refer to it as, is a result of some deep soul searching that Jay has done recently. The Renegade then vows revenge on Don Kernodal and Ivan Koloff for the hurt of Jay Youngblood, as Mark put it. I take it the NWA World Tag Team Champions are supposed to be intimidated by this, although I highly doubt it. Pistol Pez, Watley, and Brian Adidas team up to face the team of Paul Kelly and Jesse Barr next. Watley and Adidas are able to demonstrate good teamwork before Barr attempts to catch the pistol as he comes off the top rope. However, they both fall into the corner. Recovering first, Barr then slams Watley and gets a near fall. Barr then tags in his partner Kelly, but all he manages to do is get hit by Pistol Pez Watley's flying forearm and lose the effort for his team. Backstage, once again, Bob Cottle gets the rebuttal from the Pride of the Carolinas, Don Kernodal, the Russian bear Ivan Koloff, and his nephew, Nikita Koloff, towards Jay Youngblood and Mark Youngblood's earlier statements. Oh, sorry, I should say the renegade. The NWA World Tag Team Champions then make a pact with one another, vowing to put any team they get into the ring with going forward into the hospital. Why? Because Jay, the renegade, Youngblood, ran his mouth. That's why. The duo then turned their attention to a tag team that actually is intimidating, the Road Warriors and Lauren Hawk, who have recently challenged for the NWA World Tag Team Championships. Don Kernodal and Ivan Koloff are ready and are not going to be taking any chances with the Road Warriors. More backstage action is next as Bob Cottle then interviews the self-proclaimed exotic Adrian Street and his ballet, Miss Linda. It seems that recently both Street and Paul Jones have developed some bad blood between one another. During a recent match between Street and Jimmy Valiant, Paul Jones interfered in the match, attempting to attack Valiant himself. Street, for some reason, stepped in between the two and then temporarily teamed up with the Boogie Woogie Maniac, ew, before the assassin had to come to Paul Jones's aid. The numbers game proved to be too much for the assassin alone, but that secret weapon in Kamala then came down to the ring and inflicted some serious damage. All Street has to say about this is that he wants to get an opportunity to face Paul Jones in the ring himself before Paul Jones himself comes down and answers the challenge. Oh, talking Hi, about Bob. idiots. Hi, Bob. Hi, girls. And if you don't watch it, you're going to be on the registry. Street threatens to sick 
Miss Linda on Paul Jones, resulting in Paul Jones grabbing Miss Linda and tossing her to the side. Final Adrian Street then, and only then, jumps on Paul Jones, resulting in a fight between the two. Jimmy Valiant then comes out, and the three of them continue to fight into the backstage area. All I have to say is any friend of Jimmy Valiant is an enemy of mine. Pistol Pez Watley and Brian Adidas are next up to be interviewed by Bob Cottle, and Brian has taken some serious offense as to the craziness of the previous segment. If I, I wasn't watching the monitor back in the back, but if I'd been watching it, I'd have been out here at his, at his service too. He then says he and the pistol are ready to go. Go where? Watley then issues a warning to Kamala before saying that he and Brian Adidas are going to be continuing to team up together and are focusing now solely on the NWA World Tag Team Championships. Speaking of the World Tag Team Champions, they're in action next against Vinny Valentino and Bret Hart. Have the medical professionals on standby. The World Tag Team Champions live up to their promise by constantly mauling their opponents staying on top of them and employing vicious power moves. This is on you, Renegade. The cannon is employed on Hart, sending him down for the count, while Valentino is disposed of outside the ring. After the match, the NWA World Tag Team Champions attempt to further put the hurt on Bret Hart, but the Youngbloods emerge to engage them. The young bloods manage to get the upper hand, which is unsurprising to me. They didn't just compete in one of the most grueling and vicious tag team matches I've ever seen. They were fresh, and also they attacked the NWA World Tag Team Champions from behind like the cowards that they are. Unfortunately for us, the young bloods cowardly act is the last thing that we get to see as Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling and the week comes to an end. In the WWF, Captain Lou Albano responded to the challenge of Cindy Lauper by announcing that he's chosen the fabulous Moolah to be his representative, while Cindy Lauper herself has chosen Wendy Richter. George the Animal Steel and his manager Mr. Fuji seriously put the hurt on Jose Luis Rivera and then attempted to ambush WWF World Heavyweight Champion Hulk Hogan. While in the Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling area, the Renegade was birthed from the hurt of Jay Youngblood. Just what the hell are you thinking, Jay Youngblood? Or the Renegade, as you currently want to be called. You set out on this personal quest of revenge and outline a challenge to both Ivan Koloff and Don Kernodal, who then turn your challenge around on its head and start putting people in the hospital. If you'd have just kept your mouth shut and moved on with your career like a professional, what happened to Vinny Valentino and Bret Hart would never have happened in the first place. Who's next? How many people have to be hurt? How many have to be sent to hospital before you, Renegade, and your loser brother, Mark Youngblood, realize just that? You both are losers. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Tyler Vance Rants. Don't forget to hit the bell, like the video, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow me on social media where there's plenty of fun wrestling things for you to check out. And also, I would really appreciate it if you shared it with your family and friends. That's it for me for this week. I'll see you next week. So long for now. And almost tosses Rene Goulet, Goulet and as well to rub salt in the rooms, runes, but thankfully that secret weapon Kamala came and sit and what?